theme is that of um, Winchings about how the production of spatial on production of spatial injustice, and basically it's not it is not a contestation of theories in the north or north versus south or local versus global, but it's much more about how certain concepts get uh, appropriated and implicated in the politics, to, in the wider politics of transforming city territories. Yeah? It is in this context the paper explores the manner in which the rhetoric of the right to the city articulated dominantly as legal titles to land for housing in the Indian context is mobilized both by the, by the state progressive groups and competing economic actors in the politics to claim territory. The legal title uh, to land is often used by the state to justify eviction and relocation linked to implementation of projects for urban renewal, urban renewal and in particular forms of infrastructure investment and real estate development in the city. Relocation as a way of securing legal titles also finds its support from constituencies across different political domains, particularly progressive groups, that is the large NGOs and a section of academia. All of these groups appropriate Desato, Desato's thesis for land titles. And here the right to the city agenda have focused on two aspects, specifically in the Indian context, which is on provision of titles or licenses to place and digitization of spatial and demographic data to clarify occupancy. While the former targeted specific spatial and occupational categories, particularly the so-called slums and markets dominated by small and medium traders, the latter program for constructing digital archives mobilized technology to simplify occupancy, and the aim here was to establish one-to-one -one relationship between the land and the processor. At the surface, all of these may seem a rational choice to strengthen the claims of the supposedly marginal groups in the city, especially who are identified as the poor. The rationalization is also based on the assumptions that the neighborhood are anyway affected by declining investments and insecurity, insecure land tenure that renders it difficult to capture the land market gains. However, a closer look at the politics, uh, politics um, uh, politics at the places where these, uh, which are targeted, suggest how the property and uh, claims get reconfigured, -con both as a collective and individually. And it is in this politics, the, ca uh, the way informality and illegality, the categories of informality and in illegality gets mobilized, becomes critical. Because all of these are arbitrary constructions in the Indian context, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Indian context, and therefore the boundaries are extremely fluid. To understand this further, it's useful to situate the political milieu in which these categories circulate. The construction of legal and spatial, illegal spatial claims circulate in a place and time where state-led investments in land and infrastructure are geared towards promoting real estate development by large developers. Like other Asian cities, this is centered on high-end developers to promote housing and dedicated spatial economic uh, enclaves for economic act activities, which is the SEZ, which has been talked about in several literature. And both, both these are aimed to bring in, supposedly aimed to bring in foreign investment. What it meant in creating such spaces within a city and connecting them across different Indian city necessitated reclaiming neighborhoods and in real, from various groups, including the who are holding territories in them. In realizing this, a key hurdle, particularly in the Indian context, is the acquisition of land. And one of the reasons that it became an uh, issue is also the diverse forms of collective and individual tenure, and also the different legal regimes, legal and institutional regimes that supported uh, tenure forms recognized in law. So what in effect it meant is that the land and property tenure forms had to be homogenized and uh, in order to facilitate acquisition. In such a milieu, the categories of informality and illegality gets mobilized to define what is recognized as legal and what is recognized as illegal. And this may not have, it also means which law is prioritized and which, is, which doesn't get prioritized in this whole politics. Further, the language of, <coughs> The language of neighborhood decay, decline, and revitalization via urban renewal projects dominate in every state narrative to rationalize efforts of eviction and relocation. And it is in this context both the center city neighborhoods and periphery are targeted. But what differentiates the center city neighborhoods in the Indian context is that if you look at the closer working of these locality in terms of their property logic, density of activities and property values, it suggests a phenomenon which is far from the decline or decay 
and the transformation cannot be generalized always using the lens of gentrification or rent cap. Perhaps the Indian story suggests the contestation between different circuits of capital to claim to claim uh, territory and property. And as one of the commentators suggested in yesterday's uh, yesterday's uh, talk, it's much more the circulation of capital uh, becomes a much more useful um, lens to look at it. And also in terms of where are these, what uh, what are the competing sur capital circuits that come into play to claim a particular <coughs> locality. And this transformation led by the state is also, it also gets played out in the construction, in the fluid construction of law and knowledge about the city. And how does this rhetoric get of this uh, right to the city and legal titles get articulated in the progressive NGO politics? Now, just like you know, what's happened is that particularly large NGOs with their focus on, focus on housing project often use legal title to justify relocation and eviction to benefit certain groups. And also why it perpetuates this uh, trend is not only because of the visibility of housing project, but if you look at the financing logic of the NGO organization and the way this machine is run, it also mobilizes the same instruments of land-based finance, in particular the TDR and the, the, the transfer of development rights, the slum, <laughs> slum rehabilitation agency with increased FSI for public-private partnership. In some cases, it has led to co-optation of NGOs in state project. Now, the rest of the presentation will be organized into three parts. I start with describing the link between land and poverty process, uh, with the land and poverty process with a focus on ten, with a specific focus on tenure di diversity, and the second pro part of the presentation explores an urban renewal project in an urban city, uh, in a center city neighborhood in a South Indian city. An aim of uh, looking at this case is to illustrate how informality and illegality as a category was mobilized to, to, to justify evictions and relocation of economic, uh, economic activities, particularly different types of economic clusters. And also, the <coughs> second aim is to say, although the discussions on eviction and relocation and urban renewal in the literature tend to focus largely on squatter settlements, the process in reality affected a wider constituency. Groups affected were holding territory under tenure forms that were recognized by law. The tendency to homogenize diverse form of proper land and property tenure to that of encroachment and informality plays out in each of these conflicts. The case on urban renewal to be dis uh, the case also suggests uh, um, yeah uh, this is the third part. The third part of the presentation looks at one of the federation NGO alliances with considerable influence at the global and the national scales over policy making, and particularly with reference to this agenda of uh, right, uh, legal title as a way of strengthening land tenure, to illustrate how the right-based framework of NGOs gets implicated in the larger politics of reconfiguring territory and uh, property. Finally, although the constellation of power alliances in dom different domains, the state and NGO and economic elites, elites may suggest a closure of politics, it doesn't yet, there is still spaces for maneuvering for the groups that's affected and that remains largely in the messiness of India's everyday politics and the electoral dynamics. Expanding the boundaries of this, uh, boundaries of this space from an acad activist academic perspective necessitates a review of concepts of language that is under circulation in describing Indian cities, in particular the axis of illegality, informality, urban decay, and renewal in describing the city. Now, to start with, the why does the land politics become important? And this is drawing on the ethnographic research with Solly since 1999. And three aspects becomes important when we look at the land politics interface as it affects poor and other groups. Uh, one of the arguments that, uh, that this particular paper draws on is to view the city as a contested space, even where even the poor compete in this contestation. And the reason this is highlighted, the, the three factors highlighted. The first is the land-based financing. Which is common for, for, which is a common strategy both among the rich and the poor. Increasingly, it's becoming a strategy for state to finance some of its large projects. And the second is the second is the, the diversity of land tenure uh, forms, which uh, which uh, which, as I mentioned, 
it influences the opportunities for different categories of uh, different social and economic categories including different types of poor to locate in a particular neighborhood and these land tenure diversity in the indian context is shaped by historical land tenure regimes and they define control over territory around specific occupations like individual tenure free coal tenure rental and grant land of different categories each of these is linked to different institutional and legal regime now uh, for example see when what you see is market transactions um, even though it is come under british common law in the context of the case that i'm going to describe is governed by different rules specific to the communities religious communities for example in the context of mumbai properties controlled by catholic christians are governed by an agreement with east india company to restrict transaction to members of the community in uh, for example with several communities have specific arrangements this was one of the problems that uh, that the state faced when it came to implement when it came to implementing the uh, digital digitization of land title in it and in a, in bangalore for example the state had to confront 1500 tenure form at the time of digitizing titles and this is the land tenure forms and this is to be differentiated from the built property tenure forms and a related aspect is that how tenure is claimed now often as i played it, this gets played out in different institutional circuits the way each community claims tenure and when does it decide to consolidate it and which level of legality it would like to retain the connection to land why does it become important is something that i'll come to later and the third thing that it, one uh, the third aspect of the what this ethnographic research showed is the connection between the land and politics as it plays in the neighborhood level here what is critical is that the density of congregation the flexibility of space flexibility of space use which are all very much related to how localities are structured influence the opportunities of different groups how do these three aspects matter to the right to the city debate and the legal title debate that's under question the legal title agenda of the state is driven by two reasons particularly this is a debate that came up in the indian context post 1995 and it reached a pitch in 2000 when the when like many other cities it was hoping to land itself in the global hierarchy one of the biggest reason for the clarity of occupancy is to facilitate appropriation and acquisition every time many of the urban renewal projects or infrastructure programs that were imp- that were slotted for implementation in metro projects often confronted this often was stalled due to the land acquisition conflict and one issue they had was the diverse the tenure forms the greater the constituency they had to deal with and uh, so the key concern then was to how do you reduce homogenize the tenure form not only it's about the diversity of tenure form on the ground it's also about dealing with different legal regimes uh, via which papers were granted this was echoed in the narrative the difficulty they face and what they saw as the success of the program as linked to the reduction of tenure forms was echoed in the narrative of the architect to india's land digitization program in one of the world banks uh world bank's best practices awards program what he quoted was that the success of the bumi program which is a, which is cited as the best practice land title land uh, digitization of land title rec- program in the state is that the program managed to reduce the uh, tenure forms from 1500 to 2256 forms now what is opaque is however the manner in which the tenure forms were reduced one way of realizing it is to homogenize the categories under which tenure was recorded to ownership irrespective of whether it's lease rental or sharing the other way it was registered is that the genealogy of land was removed so the uh, number of claimants other than the present claimants was often difficult to find out that is at one level why does this land acquisition becomes uh, important for the state because if you look at the recent book by Uh, by sanjay chakravarty where he has uh, the price of the land in the indian context or you look at the number of the the financing strategy of various um, infrastructure project it's very much based on land land based financing whether it's a metro it depends on the mall that has to generate the finance to repay the investment that's plowed back if it is a large infrastructure highway project the t- tendency is to acquire more land that than that is necessary and to capture the real estate gains as the circulation of the traffic increases 
So the land on this, uh, the other way the land-based financing strategies take, uh, take form is also in terms of transfer of development rights. This comes up particularly in the center city area where uh, urban renewal projects has to be implemented and private sector, private developers have to be involved. Mm -hmm. And the classic, uh, the, the more refined it is, is, is it in places like Bombay where the developer can develop relatively low, low land of con that is considered to be relatively of a low real estate value and transfer the tra and transfer the development rights to a locality with a high real estate value you have various options of it and it is into this market ngos also play up to mobilize their finance and second is the playing of the real estate market and third is the the slum rehabilitation uh, projects also recast the same logic of transfer of development rights or public private partnership and it is in this way that finance is mobilized and the way it is relying more and more on land is what is leading into this politics of, uh, is also playing into the politics of uh, how legality and illegality is constituted in the city. To understand this better, I start with a description of an urban renewal program. As this case demonstrates, urban renewal programs in, the Indian, in Indian cities have often been used as attempted entry points to allow for new groups to control territory. And this politics is played out not necessarily via the market, but more via the legal and the party political domain. It involves changes to the planning and development laws, as well as control of decision making at the level of local government, where party political structures played a much larger role. Thus, the difficult. Yeah. Okay, the, 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 loca the, first, the market case, the case that I uh, discover below is of a center city urban renewal project in one of the center city neighborhood in the South Indian city of Bangalore. Bangalore, uh, was, as most of you know, is considered as the IT capital of uh, uh, India and much of the projects is geared around this, um, no sh um, geared around this apparent IT and all these uh, geared around IT capital and biotechnology capital, which are supposedly gen going to generate um, uh, foreign investment into the city. But the city is always also evolved around, it's predominantly a small and medium, uh, it's a predominantly, uh, uh, its economic activities is predominantly constituted of small and medium manufacturing, trade and service activities. And some of these trading clusters are also linked to the global circuit. So whatever this conflict over urban renewal, as I mentioned in the beginning, is not about local versus global, but about the competing capital circuits and who has to be prioritized. The first case that I, the, the case that I'm going to describe now involves a conflict that arose between around the urban renewal program starting from the 1999 and involves the range of a group, the range of traders, starting from wholesale traders, retail traders, who are technically supposed to be in the formal, formal uh, trading wing, and the informal street traders. Yeah. Now, this division between formal and informal is really, uh, really difficult because it's very difficult to say who is who is coming into conflict with law and at which level. So, broadly, it is the the program covered a range of actors with differing relationship to law. Among the groups that was particularly affected are those are, are the traders, and in this uh, in this particular war, traders from different ethnicities specialized in different types of trade. The the KR market uh, conflict itself, as this uh, diagram shows, there are several clusters, and the research my, there are several economic clusters, but my research focus on eight such clusters, which are predominantly dealing with perishable trade. And uh, each of them are located on land and property. Uh, the land and property, uh, the land is owned by different owners. Like, and therefore, the institutional, the legal regime also different. For example, L3. This was a this was a locality which prior to the colonial rule came under the Islamic regime. And in the Indian context, both the colonial rule, as much as the colonial rule, the Islamic regime also have very detailed land laws, and those land titles are still valid. So the mosque is belongs. Uh, what you will see in this uh, particular. Because this territory itself was where the ruler was located, uh, much of the properties were with the Muslims. 
and then they were they, uh, post independent they were given to a specific uh, uh, institution which is the work board to regulate it and the minority board to regulate it so although you have a common land law the way work property is transacted and the work property is rented out or leased out is based on the religious uh, is is controlled by the mosque which was dominant in this region so what the property within that individual built property can be occupied in several forms there are renters there are leasers and there are also sharers that's because of the way uh, most of these traders started as poor street traders and then moved up the hierarchy over three generation into wholesale trade so most of these uh, businesses are also um, uh, also a joint household business with various share, various hierarchies of claims to a one particular property and secondly you have another type of market which is controlled which is owned by which is built by the agricultural produce marketing uh, committee which is corporation which is a para state and organization but the property itself was sold to individual traders so what you find here is a mix of uh, ownership rental and long term lease and in front you as usual you have the sharers you have occupiers of varying high, uh, terms of hierarchy so in each of these either the ownership varies or the legal regime by which land is governed is gets varied in it so in the starting point of the conflict the urban renewal started with relocation of these uh, this is this particular area was the city's main node for uh, wholesale and retail market so and um, most because most of the trading activities and allied manufacture it was also an area where textile production which was the first uh, economic base of the city started but even though the mill economy declined it then sprang a whole series of small uh, textile workshops which is also located in this area as i mentioned i am focusing mainly on the market conflict and i haven't although other economic activities were also affected i'm not focusing on that politics in this paper um the starting point of the conflict between these market clusters around perishable trade started in 1995 and it's and then with the, and it expand and it went on till to 2008 the struggle is still not complete it is still open ended it can be opened up at any time in 1999 uh, the first starting point was the targeting of this retail market which is marked as l1 in the picture l1 in the picture and that was uh, to be converted as the that is where the original market started it started as like in any other city it started as a open market space and then the government the first um, engineer of the who's also the nation's renowned engineer constructed the first market place in 1956 so most of the uh, property ownership are uh, the property most of the shop owners there had a legal agreement rental agreement or ownership agreement with the corporation the idea of renewal was that that because these were retail traders and wholesale traders and there was also competition coming in from mncs there was also competition coming in from the it lobby who saw this as a connecting point between bangalore and the connecting cities so the renewal project origin of renewal project is linked to how do we how do we bring in more infrastructure connection into it and also how do we get in uh, multinational mncs to control some of the warehouses because the conflict was also to be located at a time when india was talking about opening up retail market retail trade to mncs and therefore uh, the reconstruction of the territory is linked to several of these smaller projects how do you open up trade how do you open up land for infrastructure investments yeah and uh, so the first group that was set up was a lobby of it it uh, batf which solly had uh, written about bangalore agenda task force which is a group of um, no, so called civil society actors comprising of venture capitalist it specialist and financiers who started to develop this uh, model urban renewal project it did not go too far then in 1999 the the corporation again started the discussion to convert this retail market into a mall the design of the market and the design of the market was very much uh, oriented towards a car uh, car owning population and that uh, the the mall is to be linked to a metro station that is going to come there and the finance was linked to both these things but however this conflict went on because of the density of population it, it did not go anywhere 
the and the conflict which started in 1996 went on till 2001 and over the period the project got modified but uh, the relocation was given up in, in the context of l1 and but some traders could get, gain control some could not and they had to move out of the locality but in 2001 taking advantage of the drive uh, encroachment drive moved in the city because by then by 2001 because the it the politics of the city was such that the it group and the and the and their alliances were at there had an upper hand and they also had a direct uh, influence over the decision making via the chief minister because of the specific politics the language of encroachment and encroachment drive got popularized in the city and taking advantage of the encroachment mood in the city traders uh, another set of traders who were occupying another cluster in l3 was evicted in 2000 between 2004 and 2005 now but in order to effect this eviction was also not so easy in order to do this they had to deal with uh, deal with the work board which they did via the party structures and second they had to change the use of land land use law and this was done via a parliamentary resolution and third they had to control the decision making at the local at the local government level here again a party representative will sit in the in the standing committee uh, standing committee of the municipality and often the decisions were were just taken aback because of the party hierarchy and the fourth uh, specific uh, thing to the to the indian context is the role of the courts the court is one if you have read the indian literature and particularly the conflict between the state and the poor people the court was one of the important institution which often used to lean on the side of the poor but by 2000 the attitude changed all the every, anyone who opposes any mega city project in the courts i uh, became a uh, encroacher became a person who is illegal and informal so by a court decree in one case also affects other cases so the, uh, the decision of the supreme court to implement certain projects in delhi affected the um, affected the uh, extent to which people can affected groups can maneuver in other parts of the country and the role of the court shifted uh, very significantly in favor of mega city projects and if you read any of the um, uh, there are enough research about the role of courts and the Uh, which has documented this process it's also documented this process in terms of the environmental law projects when suddenly every small industry was seen as illegal informal and illegal and had to be removed out the delhi case is a classic example and this the uh, basically uh, to go back to this whole case the way the state rationalized the project for relocating the market is useful The, as i said the project was implemented between 1995 to 2005 in order to do this firstly the regional state tapped into the demand made by traders in 1978 for upgrading the infrastructure for trading at this locality at that time traders are negotiated for relocation of all three trades to a locality which was then outside city boundary the plan was not imp- implemented due to disagreement over location and also the difficult uh, also the state's aversion to cre- to density um, to density and the clustering of the three trades together and between but however between 1978 and 2000 trading economies grew rapidly at the center city ward and the state had also made several interventions in changing the markets yeah in terms of upgrading the markets in terms of moving out certain clusters from the wholesale uh, separating the wholesale and the retail trade and creating specific markets for each of them so in 2001 the situation was completely different not only has the trade expanded they have also each of these eight clusters are in effect the creations of state interventions at different point in time and they the, the, the trade has expanded the cluster they also had the complementary trades located there and this uh, resulted in a stalemate which is the first reason the state decided to go in for a resolution a uh, resolution in the in the parliament to effect the land ch- to land use change so the second thing that they also why was the state interested in shifting and if you listen to the different logics of the different institutions involved in it 
because different players were interested in, in this particular place. One was a group that came from that the MNCs who wanted to use some of the uh, markets, convert these markets into uh, warehouses or for food storage. And the space was there, the infrastructure is there, it only required modification. And then the state, which had its own logic of how to finance the infrastructure pro cooperation in the projects in this area. Then you had the IT group, which was more interested in cutting, in building flyovers that cut the trade across this ward. And they, they were also by this time interested in opening up, uh, opening up the real estate market in Center City Ward to large developers. And that was, uh, what happened is that it's not, a, it's often in the Indian context, because of the history of the place and the way locality politics operate in, uh, in, play, in localities where there is a very diverse and dense congregation. It's often difficult for large developer to have a clean sweep, particularly in dealing with the tenure forms. So all these factors, when, BC, when, the, uh, when the BCC, the court rule, after, could not deal with it, one of the ways in which the project, uh, the state dealt with it is a resolution in the parliament. And by this time, some of the clusters, when the court battle was lost, uh, now the court battle linked to not the informal, the so-called small traders versus the state, it was linked to the wholesale traders versus the state over the issue of um, entry of multinationals into the retail trade and that got spilled over to who will control which space in the city. Now when this, um, when this conflict actuated, the state itself started using different institutions to in implement the project. Although the agricultural produce markets are, are regulated in theory by agricultural produce and marketing cooperation, when the conflict started, many of these projects came, came to be directed through urban development, urban development, um, Department of Urban Development. That meant it has to be converted into some form of market construction, in some form of uh, uh, infrastructure building projects. Yeah, that is at one level. And um, when the state passed the resolution in that, uh, so because of this um, very desperate, disconnected conflicts, which was not, which was stalling the uh, project at different, uh, dif through different routes, what the state decided was to go for the resolution in the assembly to discontinue trade in the ward. The order to denotify the trade was passed by APMC, although planning was not its, con uh, was not its mandate. And the process of denotification involved change of land use in some parts of the market, which had the impact of pushing all traders into illegality. The APMC then, with the support of the different wings of the police, moved in to evict once formal traders and street traders on grounds of illegal occupation. And uh, this is a court which came out of the uh, traders, which led into the conflict between uh, traders in this ward and the state. Uh, and it also resulted in a street protest. And why is it that, despite the, uh, um, why is it despite this denotification and having a powerful tool, the state was not able to uh, remove this uh, traders in the end? It's also because of the substantive Muslim traders who are occupying, controlling property in this uh, in this area. Now the politics of the place got to, uh, shifted to another plane with the Muslim traders speaking that they will use the religious angle to fight it out and this is a locality which had had the ethnic conflict. Now that kind of, uh, that kind of pushed the state uh, backwards and the state it, it witnessed the urban development minister and the state chief minister to visit the locality and guarantee protection against eviction. Now, why, by this time, what you have to do, uh, what has happened in the city is also decision making at local government level, decision making at various parastatal level were more or less standstill. Every decision that was related to urban development investment, evictions, relocations, uh, it gets centralized at the level of chief minister and his very senior party leaders. Uh, and the one day, and it is at, it is in this juncture the legality also comes in conflict. When you understand the Indian politics, it's one strand of any strand of political thing. The use of uh, terms like illegality, legal title for eviction, everything get used in this conflict, and the politics itself is unpredictable. But it messes the situation further. And the second case where I wanted to uh, go quickly is the is the. Ten minutes, five minutes. Okay, it's a case of periphery. Okay, it's a case of periphery where again this was a land which was um, allotted through a historical tenure regime as a collective tenure. Now, though there were 12 locations, this is a land in the periphery which is a 
it it offered uh, about f minimum space that was allotted for such markets was not less than 25 to 30 acres which is a fantastic land for SEZ development and mall development and there were 12 such locations thriving in the city and people had um, the traders themselves had uh, moved between these locations and they had a kind of right to use the land and that the land itself the use of the land itself used to be marked in survey of india maps and the local government planning maps but since 2001 one of the ways in which they erase these claims is also played out in how, what do you record and what do you not record now the land digitization policy uh, project that i mentioned in before was also linked to this politics of which of these claims that you inscribe and how do you ascribe legality to which claims you will prioritize within the law? Now, it is within this context, the legal titles, agenda, and the language of informality and formality became problematic. Now, how does it intersect with the approach of uh, progressive groups? The legal title uh, agenda got its teeth also in part because of the lobby by the large NGOs. And one of the key NGOs who played a role is, of course, the slum dwellers and shack dwellers in the international and their Indian affiliates. Okay? Now, uh, because of the time conflict, I just say there were two disconnects. One is that to link land for housing. By conflating land and housing relationship, what they also did is that they gave out all the tenure relationship that existed in a particular place, either for economic activities for housing, and thereby it affected people who are not able to prove their so-called ownership right. And secondly, pushed them, most of them, into the periphery, which problematized their work housing relationship. Yeah, but why is it? Why is this NGO? I end this with this last slide. Okay, why is the case of uh, large NGOs is becoming an uh, issue? Because of most of these NGOs, particularly we have a handful, one of them is the slum and shack dwellers, which call this say, not only in uh, how land policies must be operated, particularly vis-a-vis -vis, uh, low-income groups, uh, but also what are the other activities that they are engaging. And it is here the way their own financing operation, in a sense, they have also morphed as a real estate developer. The... Mm -hmm. And uh, in real estate developer, the running of their machine, SGF itself is a very complex organization. It does not necessarily represent every NGO, every squatter dweller or, a, uh, or the slum dweller in the city. But because of their scales, because of the scales with which they operate and because of the support that they receive from the international development agencies and the national agencies, they are far more powerful with the policy circuits. Yeah? And in the context of SPARC and NSDF, they entered 32 cities in India. And they have, as uh, Garrett mentioned, about influence in nine African cities, although their constitution is extremely thin. And in the context of NGO, their influence often comes via City Alliance and uh, World Bank. And one of the most controversial programs is Mumbai Urban Transport Plan, which is where they crystallize this whole idea of legal title for eviction and relocation for legal title. And also, the renegotiated, uh, according to them, they have influenced policy in terms of how do they uh, implement resettlement program. And the negotiation for the urban transportation plan was almost over this table that the NGO will organize the removal of the community in return for housing, promoting housing. Now, and then what happens is that according to the one of the um, one of the one of the organizers of NSDF is that he often allowed the three days of eviction so that it becomes a desperate situation for communities to come back and ask for a housing project. And on the other hand, none of these organizations can deal with this constituency to move them out of that particular place, either because of party demo electoral politics or for various local politics that it can get into. And for them, housing and TDR has become one of the transfer of development right has become one of their major source of financing. And his quote is that TDR is a gold mine. We need not even go and ask for any more development project. And the, uh, the NGO itself has collected several TDRs in the city. In effect, that 5% of every government project has to be allotted, has now, particularly the re-eviction and relocation project, has a component of allocation to NGOs. 
So that is at one level. Because the organization operates at different scales, it's large, it's, it's real running cost. The running this machine is in itself is an issue. And therefore, it also perpetuates these instruments like transfer of development rights. And um, SDF, the India component, also opened a real estate company in order to take up as a way of generating further finance. So what happens is that their own financing strategy, their own getting into it, further and further reinforces the argument for title, evictions, and relocation. So um, now the latest um, conflict is, <laughs> is uh, moved into not only the materiality of legal title, but also about who will construct the knowledge of the poor. So it operates between who will assure who, which legality can be guaranteed and also which type of knowledge that is done. So in conclusion, the, this, uh, this presentation sought to highlight the politi um, So One of the th aim of this uh, presentation is to highlight how categories like informality, illegality, and legal titles get appropriated in this politics to reconfigure territories and property. And uh, uh, what we are talking about is not necessarily a local versus global concept, because people who are affected are connected to different levels of local processes and global processes. The traders, some of them operate at the uh, global scale. They have an export uh, trading in vegetables. Yeah? Uh, but what is important is that is the shrinking of spaces and the role that NGOs play and the way land-based financing and land development regimes are perpetuating it. Um, uh, but I don't think this means a closure of politics. As of now, because there is still there is space for this messiness, it has not been completely easy either for the NGOs or the state to do a clean sweep. But the situation is uh, it can change, and it's very fluid depending on how the politics of the country changes. That's it. Okay, then let's discuss it over lunch because we have a bit of a Let's thank the two presenters for that very interesting presentation.